Hello, everyone, and welcome to this first live event for the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. We're glad you're here. My name is Adele Halliday, and I serve as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead Staff at the National Office of the United Church of Canada. So thanks for joining us today. Today's conversation is with the Reverend Dr. Paul Douglas Walfall, who will engage us in a conversation about becoming an anti-racist disciple. So welcome, Paul. I will introduce him in a moment, but a few logistics first. For those of you who are here on Zoom, your audio will remain muted throughout the gathering and your cameras will remain off, but please feel free to use the chat. <clears throat> Excuse me, please feel free to use the chat throughout. Uh, please allow me to introduce Paul, who will first lead us through a land acknowledgement and an opening prayer. And then after that, we'll give you an overview of how the rest of the uh, gathering will pro progress. So Paul Douglas Walfall is a member of the Executive of General Council and the United Church's Anti-Racism Common Table. He is ministry personnel at First United Church in the Northern Spirit Regional Council, and Paul lives in Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta. So welcome to you, Paul, and over to you for the um, acknowledgement of land and opening prayer. Thank you, Adele, and welcome everyone. For thousands of years, the First Nations and Indigenous peoples of this land have tended and cared for the land. Their spirituality and focus on the nurture of the land and the nurture from the land has been central to their lives. As we begin today, we acknowledge that we are on land that has been settled by people thousands of years before we arrived. I'm talking to you from Fort Saskatchewan, which is um, on Treaty 6 territory and the nations that comprise Treaty 6. We are all treaty people. We owe a debt of gratitude and uh, an a requirement to live in right relations with those whose land we are on. I invite you now in the chat, just indicate what territory or area you are from, including the territorial um, acknowledgement for the land. And if you know the nations whose land you are sharing, please do enter it as well in the chat. As we indicate that, let me invite you to a time of prayer. Holy God, you are with us now and your word reminds us that without you, we can do nothing. We acknowledge your presence, not simply as a bystander watching this proceedings, we acknowledge your presence for we need you in this conversation. Give us the wisdom, give us the words. Open our minds to possibilities. Put a, help us to put aside our defenses. Help us to hear you even as we hear each other. And grant that the love which you have for us, the love as we have seen in Jesus, may be so seen in all that we do today at this time, that when we shall leave from this place, we will be filled with awe and with great anticipation and expectation to continue the work you have begun. We pray this trusting in your name. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Paul, for opening us in such a good way. And uh, I hope people will continue to write into the chat the traditional territories where you are located. Um, an overview of what we are going to be doing for this evening and a bit of context for our conversation. Uh, 
Um, today we are um, today we are gathered in the context of the 40 days of engagement of anti-racism. And this is a program that is running um, uh, starting today <laughs> and it's running for 40 days uh, with the exception of Sundays. Um, and um, we hope that some of you might continue to participate in all of the other ways uh, that this program is happening. This is the first live event that is taking place and they're going to be happening on every Tuesday uh, from now until um, the end of November. To access the rest of the content, uh, you can go to the website, the United Church website, um, and you'll find lots of activities there. This is the landing page, and once you go in, you'll find uh, this is Paul's um, day here for day one. Um, and when you scroll down, uh, you'll find a, this a bit of an overview of the day, and then you'll see um, you'll also see the uh, um, a bit more context in terms of what's happening on the day. So um, here's a fuller description. You'll find activities, um, a learning uh, way for learning, um, some ideas for engagement, uh, engaging with children and, and young people, uh, commitment, some a group commitment and ideas for advocacy. So it's a full, a full day that you can do either on your own or with a small group. Um, and so here's Paul's day here. And today we'll be pulling from some of the content that he's written for a conversation. And we're gonna do this in a bit of a conversational style. So some of you may have questions as well, please feel free to write them into the chat and we'll leave them to our conversation. Another facet of the 40 days is just, um, is books. Um, and the United Church Bookstore is offering some discounts on books and there's a featured book each and every week around anti-racism. This week's book is about preaching. Um, so you see uh, preaching about racism, a guide for faith leaders by Carolyn Hessel. Um, there's a discount available if you buy two or more books um, and um, the discount code is 40 days. So you'll get 20% off if you order two or more books between now and the end of November. So just to let you know that that's another facet that you can engage as well. So without further ado, let's engage Paul in a conversation about what it might mean to, around becoming an anti-racist disciple. Um, so Paul, first, this you've written this great uh, learning piece around becoming an anti-racist disciple, but first, what does being a disciple of Jesus mean to you? Well, being a disciple of Jesus, and thank you very much, um, Adele, you're, you're, you're more than being gracious in describing the, what I wrote as being great. <laughs> um, being a disciple is central to my faith. The, the word disciple um, means literally a student, uh, a one who sits at the feet of a master and learns and is disciplined, is a disciplined learner, one who follows that which has been taught and not only what they have heard, but also what they have seen and intentionally seeking to put it into practice. So as a disciple of Jesus, I continue the work of Jesus, learning from Jesus in a, from what I've read in scripture, from my own experience of faith um, to, to, to represent or represent is the better phrase. Jesus to all that I meet. And it doesn't mean that I'm perfect. It doesn't mean that I, uh, I am any great um, spiritual guru. It just simply means that I, my intention in life is to, is to allow the, uh, this, the chorus, which is the beauty of Jesus to be seen in me. Um, and it, so therefore, my guide, my, my friend, my companion in life is Jesus. And to allow what he stands for, stood for, what he taught, or what he presented himself to be, um, to be seen in my in my living, and all my incompleteness and all my imperfections. Great, thank you, Paul. It's a great overview of what it means to be a disciple. Um, but can you share a little bit more about what it might mean to be an anti-racist disciple? And here is where the um, language sort of trips us up because the way we put it, an anti-racist disciple, people can believe that you're becoming a disciple of anti-racism, which is not exactly what the phrase means. I am a disciple of Jesus and I'm anti-racist and the two things come together. And the two things I believe is it, it, almost a redundant statement within itself. Um, 
to be anti-racist means that you are intentionally standing against racism. It doesn't mean that you're not racist. It simply means that I am intentionally standing against racism. I'm intentionally standing against systems and, and a perspective that seeks to diminish or devalue people based on the, 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 the attributes of, 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 of phenotype or, or of color of skin or or ethnic background or, 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 or the, the, the type of hair or, or color eyes that you have. I, I stand against that which seeks to, to categorize people as subhuman because of their color of their skin. And th that is what it means. And intentionally to do so, it's not, it's not being fence-sitting. And likewise, the disciple of Jesus is not a fence-sitter. And for Jesus who taught about love, loving your neighbor as you love yourself, for Jesus who, who encountered the, the Samaritan um, the, the leper uh, and, and still engaged this person with, with love and acceptance, for, for the what I call the extravagant and extraordinary love that Jesus showed um, in, 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 in his living, and in his preaching, that is what being a disciple means. And, and it, it synchronizes with, with being anti-racist because it says, therefore, that if I truly seek to follow Jesus' example, there's no way I believe you can intentionally um, be um, looking down on somebody because of the color of their skin or because of their race. And neither does it mean, and very important, neither does it mean that I can become a fence sitter in this process. Because, you know, to sit on the fence, but I know I, I'm not racist, you know, but, but there's no but. <laughs> You know, that, that, that's beauty. <laughs> well, thanks. That's really inspiring and exciting. You've reminded us that we can't be fence sitters. We have to be intentional. Um, the reminder about following and loving neighbor, um, all great and exciting things. So what do you think this might mean tangibly? What might be some specific ways that a person might be able to live out being or becoming an anti-racist disciple in their daily lives? Oh. I, I, I believe in, in many ways that, that it means that we, we, each one of us, must need to stop and recognize what privilege we are exercising. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I remember when I, in 2019, um, I got the privilege of visiting um, Kenya, and I remember standing in a refugee area um, and recognizing that I'm black, the people around me are black, but there was a privilege that I had that they didn't have. And, and, and the weight of that privilege came down very heavy upon me in recognizing just that, you know, I am I am free to leave Kenya. I'm, I, I live in a country where um, I have a roof over my head, et cetera, et cetera. So I have privilege. And I think we need to all recognize our privilege, but we also need to recognize at points that in it, because we have privilege, some of us have more privilege than others. Um, so because you are white, you may have the privilege of walking into Walmart and never have the experience of, uh, of a security guard walking behind you, wondering if you're going to um, steal anything. I've, I've, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have that privilege. <laughs> You know, um, you if you may you may not have the privilege of, of recognizing that when you walk into certain places, people suddenly form these expectations of you that that is rather negative. So I think we need to start first by recognizing our privilege and also to be to be vocal in saying no, this is not accepted. There's a politeness sometimes we have that we see something wrong and we, ah, no, to be anti-racist means that we're going to say it's not it's not smile and try to pretend that it doesn't exist. It's to say no, this is wrong. Um, it is also being I think as church people to 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 be more than welcoming it is be inviting especially of people of different ethnic backgrounds and and, and racial um types so to 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 to, to look at our church seriously and ask ourselves, in what, in what ways could there be barriers, could there be privilege exercised that we are not aware of? Um, do I really give the, the immigrant the chance to be themselves if I'm going to constantly complain about their accent? 
Do I really give the, the, the person from the Caribbean a chance when I'm going to constantly complain that the food is spicy? You, you know, so it, it means that we need to, to, to be able to accept people for who they are. And I think in a very real way, that is part of what it means to be anti-racist, to recognize your privilege. Look at how we, we welcome, how we treat people and and actually to 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 advocate and to to see where people are being badly treated or treated lesser than and to say how do i stop this how do i become part of the solution and not part of the problem again we need to recognize that silence just to keep silent is to be part of the problem it's not helping anybody Yes, thank you for those really tangible steps. So one, recognizing privilege, and you referenced the challenge of, of being followed by in stores by security guards. I've also had that experience as a, as a Black person of being followed around, um, people thinking I might be stealing something, uh, and, and using privilege for change. And, and second, about being vocal for change and disruption. I love it. Jesus was a disruptor. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you want to speak anything? Yeah, I'd love to hear you speak a little more about that. Too. But I, I think sometimes we have sanitized Christianity to somewhat extent uh, that we know we have we have given in a little more than that than often to the gentle Jesus meek and mild experience. Um that's not the Jesus that we really see in the in the gospels. The Jesus who spoke up um, um, about things happening, you know, the, the experience with the with the woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. You know, Jesus didn't sit on the fence in that regard. Um when 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 the the, the um the woman came and, and and washed his feet with her hair, Jesus didn't politely smile and try to pass it off. In his parables, when he speaks about the, about people who are downtrodden, um, speaking about a Samaritan or, 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 or even outraging people by talking about a son who, who takes, um, you know, what, what, what he believed was his property, really didn't own, he didn't have any property, and go off and then the father welcomes him back. Jesus was not playing the nice card. He was in fact many people were not happy with him. And, and I have a theory that if Jesus were to appear in the world today, you know, to suddenly appear out of the world, I don't think Jesus would be accepted in many churches, or, or including our own. Um, he would just be, you know, he, he's not playing the politically nice game. <laughs> That's great. I love all the encouragements. Encouragements to not be a fence or to move towards disruption, to engage in advocacy for change, to move beyond politeness and niceness. Yeah. Excellent. Um, as we continue, I would just uh, uh, encourage people, if you have questions, if you have comments, please can, uh, feel free to write them in the chat. If you have a question for Paul, um, please type it in and we'll weave that in as we go along. Paul, you're being very inspirational here, getting us all excited about what it means to be becoming an anti-racist disciple, giving us uh, ideas, tangible ways of, of moving towards us. So thank you for that. Now, in your piece, you write about the doctrine of destination. I wonder, can you talk a little bit about that and what that means? Well, I, I, I must confess that I'm not the originator of that of that particular phrase. I, I'm certain I, I borrowed it from somebody somewhere. The, 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 we are more concerned, it appears, or very concerned in our society about what we have done. Have we arrived? Have we checked it off the, the, the checklist? Um, to say we have done it. So we are, we are very concerned about the destination. And not everything becomes a matter of the destination. Some things are a matter of the process. And some things, in the words of a hymn writer, is forever beginning what never shall end. So, you know, I remember a couple of years ago, uh, a very faithful member of one of my congregations here in Canada came to me and said, how often are we going to be doing this um, land acknowledgement in church? Uh, you know, we have, we have apologized. Isn't that enough? Um, because if she's looking at the destination, you know, I have done this, therefore this should happen. It's done. I've apologized to you. You've forgiven me. Let us move on. Show me a nice. I'm not feeling to recognize that there is no... 
done it and it's, it, 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 there is a relationship now right relations is about developing the right about developing a relationship and you are always working on a relationship anybody who is in any type of relationship knows this and those people who is particularly if you're in a marital or or, or, or or very intimate relationship the moment you start working on the relationship the relationship has dead okay so Likewise, if we are seeking to be anti-racist, it's not about reaching to that destination. It's about constantly working on this relationship of, 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 of seeing the image of God in everyone and, and working towards that, um, working on that. And it's, it's an everyday process. It's a, it's a matter of education. Education is also one of those things where it's not a destination. It's a process. You're, you are learning from the moment you're born until the day you die. The, 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 it, the moment is, well, I've learned enough and I'm done, but you're dead. <laughs> so um, the, the, the doctrine of destination is that we need to move away from, say, well, I have done this and we are, we're finished. Because you see, uh, the other problem is, Adele, that we we tend to be crisis people. We don't see something until there is a crisis. So you know, um, for you have been working in general council office for from 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 Adam was wearing short pants. Uh, <laughs> that's a Caribbean phrase, by the way, people. <laughs> I mean, for a very long time. Um, and others have come in along the way to say talk about the issues of racism and, and uh, in our world. Um, suddenly, um, we see on the television George Floyd with a knee on his neck, and everybody, oh my God, what is wrong here? And, and the problem is that there, this was a crisis, and so then out of the woodwork, everybody's oh, we need to, we need to march, we need to kneel, we need to, we, we need to, we need to, we need to, and when the crisis ends, it's as if you know, we're back to normal because we have done our thing. We have done our deed. We have done the good deed to God, man, and humanity. <laughs> now, what next? If we're serious about racism, it cannot be a matter of destination. It's a matter of the process. It's a matter of working on this daily and also looking on myself and see how, can, how, how do I make the relationship better between myself and all, uh, all of God's creation. That's great. Thank you, Paul. Uh, a question has come through the chat. Uh, Paul, do you have any suggestions, Bible studies, or analogies on how to promote the notion of the continuum of authentic, authentic relationship and anti-racism as opposed to fixed start and end dates? And the person loves the notion of countering the, doctor, the doctrine of destination. So any suggestions, think, Paul? I think, first of all, if we read any of the, if we seriously read the Gospels, we will see that, that, that the Gospels really bear that out, because Jesus doesn't speak about destinations as much as a process very often. Um, I'm certain there are Bible studies around, and I, I'm certain if, with time I would be able to, to, to put my finger on them, but I think it, it really starts with, with, with an authentic looking at our faith, not through the lens of we have how good we are and how, how much we have achieved as much as continuing the process of relating to God and relating to each other. And, and, and let me just add in that if we are serious about it, then we would recognize that this runs counter to what I call the national narrative of Canada. That, you know, everything, you know, kind of, everything was good. The settlers came and we were, they hugged up and, 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 and embraced the, the Indigenous people. And there was this happiness and love all over the land. And this land was built by, by, the, by, by the sweat and brow of, 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 the, of the people from Europe. That if we are serious about not looking at the doctrine of destination, we need to look very seriously at our history and recognize that, not that we were told a lie, but there were some parts of the history that we just were not told. <laughs> and so we need to look at it broadly and recognize that there's a lot of becoming um, that, 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 that we have to, um, to engage in. And I, I will start by saying, I remember Adele, you and I, at the beginning of when we were to becoming an anti-racist church, you and I disagreed on the way it is be or becoming, be or becoming. I, I, I'm sold now on the becoming. 
That's great. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. So yes, the becoming. So it's a journey. It's a destination. We often speak about this work, a journey, not a destination. So we speak about this work as being uh, doing it consistently and persistently. It's ongoing, continuous work. Um, I wonder, is there any other, I mean, it's going to be hard work. We're we're inviting people into this lifelong journey. Uh, Are there any words of encouragement or challenge that you might offer in addition to what you've already said? Knowing this is going to be hard work, um, why should people persist? Because I think, one, this is what, I think this is the will of God, um, that we overcome the, the type of stratification and and diminishing of the of of of, of the human person i think also it, it, it is a recognition of hope um and by, by my ancestors your ancestors adele you know, we we the, the, there's a story from where from from Jamaica at least where the story of the the, the woman who comes every day and pushes this stone, this large, well, you know, it looks like a little stone out from the from the ground, but it's really a large boulder under there, and she pushes it, and she, and every day she does this for her life, and her son says to her, "Why are you doing that? It it, it won't move," and she says, "It won't move now." it will move one day. And if we keep pushing at it, it will move. Um, Hope is not passive. Hope in the Christian faith is very active. Hope is not waiting on manna to fall from heaven. Hope is working with God for the beloved community to to, to occur. It is working with God for the things of God to occur, to, 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 to become revealed even more so. So we continue um, recognizing that it may not happen in my lifetime, but you see, again, it's not, the, it's not the doctrine of destination. It doesn't matter if I don't see it, but that it happens. And, 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 I, and I carry that um, sense of um, African understanding um, because that's how our ancestors, the, 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 the former slaves, looked at it. Looked at it. You know, this thing will not happen, might not happen before I die. But you know what? It's going to happen. So I'm going to work towards it happening. I will do my part, and you take on your part. So I think that is part of the hope that we need to 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 recognize that we're working with God, and also part of the. I think what I what I have found as encouragement in the process is when we are able to see people getting it. I I thought I have a doctrine of one. So (laughs) even if one person is able to see that which is being put forward, that which is being articulated, then you know, I'm, I'm almost at that point ready to say, Lord, let us thy servant now depart. I, you know, one other person has. And, and it's, it's the one other, you know, the, it, it, we may not necessarily get um, each time or by what we're doing, everybody to understand or everybody to, to be on the same um, path. But if one, and then the next time one, and the next time one, um, that is, I think, that is part of the encouragement for me. And then, don't underestimate the Holy Spirit. She moves where she wills. <laughs> Thank you, Paul, for reminding us of our call and the movement of the Spirit. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, so I'll ask them uh, both of them, and maybe you can respond to both at the same time. So one is, um, they're wondering, Paul, if you can uh, share a little bit more about how to prepare people, particularly in our Eurocentric denomination, for this journey when people are very used to deadlines, objectives, and measurables, which is arguably counter to the notion of lifelong discipleship or lifetime discipleship. So that's one question. Uh, the other question is, um, how might we address racism when it's visible, such as from someone's actions or someone's inappropriate comment, but without getting into a conf- confrontation? Um, so the message get across uh, 
So is getting the message across that is inappropriate wrong? This can be hard to do, but what you were saying, Paul, is that it's not supposed to be easy either. Okay. Anti-racism is messy work. Um, you cannot engage in this and expect always to, to, be, to remain unmissed, as it were. And there will be times when in order to make a stance, you have to be willing to swim upstream against the tide. And at times even go against what is the popular notions around you. And that's not always easy. Um, I'm not a courageous person. I just have a tendency of just putting my foot in at the wrong time. Uh, so if we if we if our hope is to continue the, the typical Canadian politeness, then that's not gonna work. Now do I might say that you're gonna need to go out and make people angry just for getting them angry and ruffle their feathers sake recognize that we can disagree on issues and we can disagree firmly on issues. And sometimes we will not win. There's... Jesus has not called us to be popular. Jesus has called us to be faithful. And it is that faithfulness at times which will mean that we have to stand up against even our best friend recognizing that I'm not standing against you as a person, I'm just disagreeing with what you have done or what you have said or the mindset that you bring to bear. And even in that process, love you. I think we need to remember that, you know, even in disagreement, we love you. That I disagree with you doesn't mean that you are my enemy, right? At the same time, um, how do you, I, I think we have to be willing to engage as a Eurocentric church, to recognize that we need to, we all must find ways of recognizing to people. Let's put down the, the thin skinness. No one is attacking you by, call, by, by, by speaking about anti racist. No one's attacking you personally. No one is attacking you or, 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 or making a personal jab at you. And so I think we need to take down the defensiveness sometimes and to take down the willingness, the, the, ease, the ease at which we get hurt by situations, and to be in, willing to engage in, in dialogue, in conversation, and recognizing that, you know, sometimes in the dialogue there will be disagreement. So it, it's coming at it, and it again and again, in, in my congregation, for example, it just became a point that I, I began to speak about it, and when people where I had questions, I opened myself for them to ask the questions of me. Some of them, um, you know, it, it was not always easy questions to hear, but open myself to hear the questions that were asked, but kept at it. Um, now, I'm not gonna tell you that Fort Saskatchewan is 100% um, behind me, but I think one or two more people in the congregation have caught on to what I'm talking about by being anti-racist. So is that is that persistence, is that is that going at it um, and, 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 and again assuring people that this is not a personal attack on anybody. But something is wrong if in our church a black minister has to apply almost 10 times as much as his white counterpart in order to get an appointment. And I, I just think that people just have to, and it's not saying, oh God, that is so awful. It is to say, okay, if that is so, then let us work towards getting it changed. <laughs> I hope I've answered the question. I... Yes, beautifully. Thank you. Thank you. A couple more questions have come up. So um, one, uh, we're not typically good at sticking with something that we might uh, not quote, always get right. So how might we encourage people to become resilient rather than staying silent because they might be afraid of getting it wrong? Oh, well, again, it's part of taking down the defenses. We are going to get it wrong. <laughs> so let us start with that reality. We are going to get it wrong. I give thanks for the Indigenous people around me who have borne with me because I get it wrong very often in this right religious thing. 
but they have been very gracious with me and I'm saying in light manner, if we're going to start off by being afraid, then we're not going to go anywhere. So start off by saying, yeah, I, I'm going to get it wrong, but I need to forgive myself and I will crave the forgiveness of others around me in that process. Um, and I think it, it, it is important for leaders in the church to, to, to recognize that we have to be persistent on the point. You know, it's, it... God knows I love to eat. It's a discipline for me to say at seven o'clock each evening, I must not eat anything until seven o'clock the next morning. And trust me, that's a discipline. But I have to keep at it. And the more I keep at it, the easier it becomes. It won't ever be easy. It will become easier. <laughs> and I think that's the point of persistence in this matter. Great, thank you, Paul. There's a few comments that are coming through. Just people are appreciating your comments, feeling encouraged, feeling inspired. So thank you for your words and for your wisdom. Uh, so another question, in your writing, you ask a bit of a rhetorical question. So you ask, how can we have right relations with others if we do not affirm the image of God in them? And if we do not seek to love each other, even as God has loved us? I wonder if you can just speak a bit more about that or elaborate on a bit more on what you were writing about. <laughs> From Genesis, the, the point is made in, 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 the, in the Bible that we are made in the image and likeness of God. Um, there is something in us that reflects the divine. I think when we are, when we hurt each other intentionally, when we denigrate each other, I don't think we recognize that we are also tarnishing the image of God that we see in the person. So it's not just against the person, it also has, a, to my mind, has a spiritual component in that. When I affirm you, when I lift you up, when I am kind to you, I am affirming the image of God that I see in you. Um, if we are not able to recognize that in each other, then I think we are, it's not just to the other human being. I think we, we fail to recognize that we're doing something also to the Godhead that we worship. So when my, when, when my children are told, you and dot 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 go back to where you're coming from. I don't think the person who said that recognized that they were destroying the image of God that they saw in my child. Now, if we accept that love, all concepts and forms of love in, in, in the Bible speak of an unconditionality, speak of an extravagance speak of, a, a, of, a, 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 of an all-embracing experience. And this is the God we worship. So if, if God shows us that love, and this is part of having the image of God in us, therefore it must be that we must be willing also to reflect and show that extravagance, that, 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 that all-inclusiveness to others. Now, you know, if we say all are loved, they, they, then we cannot limit that all. The moment you limit all, I say all are loved, but then that all no longer exists. <laughs> you, you, your condition has removed the all. So I think in, in, our, in our retrospect, we need to say, how do I in, show this love? And this love is also intentional. We we have a lot. We, we speak a lot about agape and and but but it, it speaks of an intentionality. And one of the things about agape, it, it, that, that word agape, is that it is not an emotion. It's a choice of will. I choose to love you. Oh God, there are some people that I have to choose to love. 
Because if I didn't choose to love them, then I would walk out of church. <laughs> so it is looking upon the other human being and saying, because you are made in the image and likeness of God, I choose to love you. I choose to intentionally do that which will for your, for your highest good. And if I can't say that, then I'm saying we're operating subpar, we're operating at a level below which we are speaking. And that is, by definition, intellectual dishonesty. Wonderful. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Um, in another part of your writing, you uh, offer a faith reflection and touch on the book of Ephesians. And in your writing, you share that the writer of Ephesians does not mention racism specifically, but he does talk about acceptable behaviors as members of the church. So I wonder if you might speak a little bit about that in relation to um, what we're talking about, anti-racist discipleship. Um, there's a notion that sometimes occur in the life of the church that churches are free for all, right? If any, and you do anything, you can get away with it. <laughs> You know, because it doesn't matter what, what you believe, it doesn't matter what you do. Um, no. Uh, the, 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 the New Testament writings in particular put an expectation that all words must match our action or our action must match our words. Because the, the entire um, Judeo-Christian um, Bible, puts emphasis on word. Word is not just hot air that we are spewing out to people. Word is indicative of action. So God spoke and it was done. So when we speak, we are speaking up where we're indicating action in our words. And it was the point, um, the, the late poet Maya Angelou that made the point that you know, she doesn't allow negative words to be spoken around her, or she didn't allow it because she said it had power. So likewise, as Christian people, there's an expectation, and, and the, or, or the, the younger generation said, we have to walk the walk and talk the talk. And if we are to do that, then there are certain things that should not be named among us, there's an expectation. There's a when I was at theological college, one of the lecturers there would say, "There's a level below which we do not go." And I think it, it, by saying that we don't go below that, but we're we're, we're maintaining this this love. So if we if we speak about an unconditional love, therefore we cannot be doing things which go counter to that love. That in itself is a contradiction. If we are saying that the God we worship is a God who has created all human beings, therefore the next human being that I see, I need to respect that and love that person. And there was no subhuman being created. And I take that Genesis is not to be taken literally, but the Genesis writer is emphatic in pointing out that there was no subhuman made. <laughs> so let it not be named among us is a, is a reminder to us that we need to walk the walk and talk. And, and, and as far as racism is concerned, that it should not be named in the context of the church. We should be, we should be setting an example that is light to, to the society, even if the society doesn't want to see the light. So we should not be hearing in, our, in, 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 in any congregation that, you know, whenever that person preaches because the person is black, I, I, I just don't go to church. Or I, I try and avoid when that person is, is, the, is the greeter on duty, I try and avoid that door because I don't want to touch their hands. You know, it, it, it shouldn't be, those things should not be named among us because that is not an, that is not an, a, an expression or a typification of love. 
Thank you, Paul. And thank you for naming some of the realities of the United Church, the avoidance of greeters who belong to particular racial groups. And earlier you spoke about how the difficulty of, of, of racialized ministers finding placements and how um, also how people are, uh, the difficulty that people have uh, hearing certain accents, um, particularly if they're coming from racialized bodies, all of which are forever present realities in the United Church and, and, and real expressions of racism. So thank you for continuing to name um, realities here. Did you want to comment on those a little bit more? I, I think I, the, the issue of accents, I know that I have to make a deliberate attempt to speak slower, even when I'm with Jamaicans. So it's not a matter of the accent, it's just a matter of the pace at which I feel comfortable to speak. But you know, I remember when someone met me at the door of church one Sunday morning and said, you know, Paul, I am still trying to get accustomed to your accent. And I responded, and I'm trying to get accustomed to yours. And she was taken aback. What do you mean by accent? I don't have an accent. I said, yes, you do. And I said, do you know how many Sundays I am at the church door and I'm smiling and nodding and saying, yes, yes, <laughs> because I really don't understand a thing that people have said to me, <laughs> but I do not make it into a point of, of, of debasing people. I have made the effort to try to understand the accent. And that's all I ask people to do for me or to anybody else. I have made the effort, you make the effort as well. And there's a time, for example, when my voice can get very soft and people may not hear me. So, you know, I've said to my congregation, if you're not hearing me, just, just put your hand on the ears and tap and I'll get the hint to speak up. Now, there are ways to, to address issues that it doesn't become confrontational, but I wish people to recognize that my accent is an expression of who I am. It's an expression of, 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 of all of the people that have come through history that have helped to make me who I am today those who I know and those who I don't know, to ask me to abandon this accent is to ask me to be not myself, not to be authentic to myself. And all it requires is a little patience and a little willingness just to learn. And yes, I hear people say, but the elderly members of the church don't, um, are, you know, they, they, they may have a hearing problem, they can't. Uh, here, uh, there's a difference between you can't hear and you're unwilling to make the effort to hear me. Now, the latter is where I have a problem. If you can't hear me because I'm speaking too soft, you know, th there are various things we can do to correct that. But, and, and, and that willingness is a part of the expression of love. It's a part of the expression of, of, of being inviting and welcoming to others. Um, and, and, not, and to abandon privilege that, oh, because you have come to my country, you must learn to speak how I speak. And I'm saying, really? When did the Holy Spirit reveal that one to you? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No, it's okay. Well, and, and, and thanks. And, and, and again, there's a clear link between uh, accents and racialization. I mean, in, in, in this church and beyond, yeah. uh, the accents that people have said that they struggle to hear are generally accents from the Caribbean, from Sub-Saharan Africa, and from Asia. No. And the accents that people can hear or maybe are more willing to hear tend to come from Western Europe and Australia and um, the United States, for example. So there's a clear link with racialization there where it's, um, there, yes, <laughs> the accents that people uh, struggle to hear are the accents of people who are in racialized bodies. And the joke um, is, Adele, that if I, if I met upon another Jamaican and we were, or even with you from, mm. uh, from St. Kitts, and we were ready to go down into real talk. Real talk. <laughs> Very few people would understand what we're they talking would. about. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. 
<laughs> Great. Well, thanks for this, Paul. A um, couple questions that are related. So uh, this concept of calling out and calling in, um, how might we call someone in when um, something is happening or when there's a comment or an incident that's going on? The second question also related, uh, the kind of unconditional love that you were speaking about earlier is a tall call. So how might you call out the evil in a God image carrier? Uh, and how would you also say that forgiveness is unconditional? Yeah, forgiveness is unconditional, but there's a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiveness I can give easily, but reconciliation is the path that I have to walk once I have forgiven or if I'm seeking to forgive. And that means um, that that's, that's a different, that's a, that's a path, that's a process itself. It's not a destination. It is the work towards that. Um, yes, the love I'm talking about is at all order, but I don't think anything about God um, is not expected to be um, a challenge. And just because it's a challenge doesn't mean that it is difficult or impossible. You know, that's why we have the Holy Spirit. Um, and we must not make the Holy Spirit redundant. Um, the, the, the willingness to, 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 to work towards is, I think, is where it starts. How am I willing to do it? You know, if I, I mean, when I was planning to come to Canada and I remember looking at what the United Church of Canada set out as the, the, the procedure for admission and add to that the, all that the High Commission sent to me as applying for um, a work permit in Canada, I looked at this thing and said, there's no way I can do this. But instead, in, in, after, after I put that aside, it was okay, I have the will to do it. So I started on a journey. Um, and I think that's where it starts, our will, our willingness to do. And if we are so locked in a corner to say that there's nothing, I'm, I, I don't see what I'm doing that, that, that needs to change. I don't see what I'm doing that needs to change. Then, the, then it, it will be forever difficult. It will be impossible because there's no willingness there to engage in the process. And I forgot the first question that you <laughs> The, the first question was about calling out and calling in. If you, if you wanted to comment on that. So I, think the, uh, I think a lot depends on the, on the way in which things are done. Um, sometimes when somebody does something racial um, that is racially offensive to me, I literally swallow hard before I respond because my first response will be out of anger. So I need to calm myself down a little and then respond to, the person will get a response, but it, it, if I, I have a, uh, eight times out of 10, if I, if I angry, answer angrily, the response I will get, it will be anger. And then what we're having is all this energy of anger going back and forth and the issue is not looked at. So, Calling out and the, the, the time, and there are times you just have to call out an individual. I, I'm, I'm not going to be that naive to believe that there, there's there, there's always an easy way to do the, to do something. But you know, so the, I think a lot depends on, on on the approach and the way we do it. And and, and again, practicing um, even with ourselves to say, okay, I hear you, but I disagree with you. And I think we need to, to come to a point sometimes in society of recognizing that you may not agree with everything I say. I don't expect you to agree with everything I say. What I want you to do is understand what I said. <laughs> um, so I, I aimed for understanding. And possibly that's the teacher within me. I aim for understanding. Um, you know, if, if you agree with every last thing I say, no. Then as I go back to the question of forgiveness, um, I remember somebody on Facebook said, um, can, you, can you disagree with somebody vehemently and still be their friend? And I said, yes, my friends must understand that I will disagree with you and I may disagree with you vehemently, but I still love you. 
And the only way I, I believe that we don't offer, I, I think there's, I, I'm trying to struggle to find a way where we don't offer forgiveness, but offering forgiveness does not mean that suddenly we become bosom, you know, we hug up and, uh, and become chummy chummy all of a sudden, no. But there are some times when I forgive you, it's a simply saying that I hold no ill feeling, no resentment against you. But it doesn't mean that, you know, we're suddenly becoming chummy friends. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, there's a related question that has emerged in the chat. And uh, have you noticed that some people say they cannot hear you more when you speak on controversial things? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> very often <laughs> i wonder who asked that <laughs> yes it it, it, it it happens it happens far too often but then you know back where i come from this say you have to take bad thing the statement in jamaica you have to take bad things make laugh meaning sometimes you have to take the, the bad and smile and laugh about it not because it is funny, but that's the way you're going to get over it. <laughs> that's great. You've offered lots of encouragement and challenges for us along the way. So um, maybe, maybe one last question for you, Paul, and then we'll give you the last word, of course. What encouragement can, might you continue to offer for people who are on the journey towards becoming anti-racist disciples. Keep on, keep on keeping on. Remember that the, 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 the issue of anti-racism is not some conceptual uh, mind, heady thing that we're talking about. It's people's lives we're really dealing with, you know. Um, talking about anti-racism is, whether or not my sons will be stopped on the road um, by police simply because of the color of their skin. Um, talking about anti-racism is whether or not people will be able to find a job um, or will need a job because, or housing or other things simply because of the color of their skins or ethnic heritage. Ethnic heritage. Speaking about anti-racism is about, is about how we treat people when they go to, to secure or seek medical help. So it's not just a conceptual ethereal topic, it is about people's lives. And for that reason, we need to keep on. And I would urge us um, to, to talk about it, to talk with each other about the journey. I, I talk with, I don't be afraid to make the mistakes, but and talk about it and support each other. Um, I think part of the most difficult, the, the diff most difficult part of the journey for me here in Canada has been oftentimes the feeling of feeling isolated and something happens in a meeting and you just feel alone. And there's uncertainty of who do you talk to? Who do I reach out to? Um, and it's to reach out to the person that will be willing to listen um, and to hear the pain and not judge me for the pain that I'm feeling in the process. Um, so yeah, keep on keeping on, support each other, talk about it and remember that the, the person, when we stand against anti-racism, we're standing up for human life. We're standing up for someone made in the image of God. We're not sitting on the fence and praying that the person will simply forget it. Because guess what? We don't. Thank you, Paul. You've given us so much this evening. Inspiration, challenge, reminders of our call. Uh, just amazing. Thank you so much. And for again, reminding us that keeping on because this is life lifelong and life-changing work. So thank yeah. you very much for this. Um, just a reminder for us all that this is the first day of the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism and there's lots of content available on the website, including Paul's full reflection, if you haven't had a chance to read that for today, 
um, and lots more reflections in the days to come. Um, this is also our first Tuesday uh, of the Zoom live events. And so every Tuesday from now until the end of November, there'll be continued events and lots more opportunities to engage with other writers and authors who have also created excellent content. So thank you very much for being here today. Um, Feel free to continue the conversation in the chat for a few minutes or online if you're connected to um, the United Church's Facebook group, the anti-racism group, um, or if you have a small group going in your community of faith, there's lots of ways to continue this conversation. As Paul reminded us, it's a lifelong work. So this is the start, but not the end. So thank you again, and uh, we hope you have a good evening. And um, I'll give you, Paul, a last word to close us off for the evening, if there's anything else you want to add. Walk good. <laughs> Walk good, my friends. Walk good. <laughs>